Hello and welcome. I'm Edward Smith, Product Marketing Manager for Vulnerability Management Solutions at Tripwire. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, just make sure you have your volume turned up on your computer. And if you have any questions, you may submit them at any time into the Questions tab, and we'll be doing a Q&A at the end of the presentation. And we'd also appreciate it if you could rate today's webcast in the ratings section, as your feedback is very valuable to us. And lastly, uh, I will be sending out a link to the recorded webcast following the live event so that you can go back and listen and, and pass on the recording to colleagues. And before we begin our featured presentation today, I did want to take uh, a few moments and provide a quick update on what's new at Tripwire um, now that we've completed our acquisition of Encircle. So with the acquisition of Encircle, Tripwire has really reaffirmed uh, its position as the leading provider of risk-based security and compliance management solutions. And Tripwire enables enterprises to effectively align their security initiatives with the objectives of their business. And the way that we do that is by providing the broadest set of foundational security controls, uh, you know, if that's, whether that's FIM, uh, SCM, uh, vulnerability management, log and event management. And we also do that by providing business context to the IT assets and prioritizing based on risk reporting. And it, it's also about bringing together these, these companies and these solutions to provide security intelligence with the combination of, of performance reporting and security visualization that allows security professionals to make better and more informed decisions. And we do this across the entire enterprise, uh, not just the critical assets, but also, you know, the less important ones, less important assets. Uh, you know, if those assets are on premise uh, or in the cloud, we can do that um, using different types of technology, such as uh, agent-based technology as well as agentless. And some important facts about the new Tripwire that you may not have known, uh, after, especially after the acquisition of Encircle in April. Um, we're, uh, you know, a very strong company, over $150 million in annual sales with over 400 employees uh, around the globe. And, you know, we're a highly profitable, well-managed company with, with over 7,000 customers in, in 96 countries. What's, what's really great about the new Tripwire offering, um, especially if you look from the perspective of the SANS top 20 con critical security controls, um, you know, as a way of, of deploying and enforcing security policies with the acquisition of Encircle, Tripwire is now able to fully support the first four on that list. And we also provide support for additional, uh, additional support for 10 other controls as well. And of course, we'll be looking uh, talking about number four today, that, you know, that vulnerability assessment. And Tripwire delivers these foundational security controls across the entire enterprise. So for your assets, uh, you know, the servers that hold your most critical data, you know, all the way to information uh, that your business partners hold. And Tripwire provides options on the frequency of your security monitoring. So we can do continuous for your critical assets, periodic for your entire IT infrastructure. And, you know, this allows organizations to choose how they would like to deploy it based on the number of devices in the enterprise. And the Tripwire product portfolio also provides a layer of analytics, reporting, and visualization on top of our foundational security controls. And we offer, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the choice of uh, an agent-based solution for most critical assets or agent-less, um, as well as on-premise and cloud-based solutions. And so these flexible and scalable deployment options allow organizations to select the products that best fit their needs to enable them to align their security initiatives to the objectives of the business. And We'll do a deeper dive on the vulnerability management slice of the uh, tripwire pie there towards the end of this webcast. But now I'd like to introduce our featured pres presenter for today. 
Our presenter today is a senior analyst at Forrester Research, where he serves security and risk professionals and works with senior information security leadership, providing strategic guidance on security architecture, security operations, and data privacy. His research focuses on vulnerability management, incident response, threat intelligence, email and web content security, and virtualization security. He's regularly quoted in the media and is a frequent guest lecturer at the University of Texas at Dallas. Please welcome Rick Holland. Thank you very much, Ed. I appreciate the introduction. And thanks to everyone out there um, on the line. I know you have busy jobs, and to set aside uh, 45 minutes, an hour of your day is no small task, so I'm appreciative of that. Um, as we get started, let's take back, uh, look back in time a little bit and see, do you guys remember this bit from Conan? In the year 2000, um, we're going to take a look back to the year 2000 and, and see how, how that compares and contrasts with today. But if you look back, and in the year 2000 or in the 2000s, I was a practitioner um, doing incident response um, in higher education as well as also doing uh, the loan security guy in a, uh, in a, in a Fortune uh, Fortune 1000 company, and we had very consistent endpoints. We had Windows XP, we had Windows Vista, but not really because no one used it. And then, of course, we had Blackberries. Um, Blackberries, pause for a second and uh, offer a little moment of silence for them, announce more layoffs, um, going to end the whole consumer business and only focus on, on the enterprise. Um, if you also look, we had the threat landscape. Here's uh, one of the, uh, the the U.S. CERT alerts for the blaster worm, which, of course, targeted XP and 2000 uh, machines. It was a buffer overflow that exploited the RPC service. Um, big worm problem for us back then. Um, then if you look at this, no, this isn't uh, your parents' or grandparents' computer, right? But this spyware and adware seemed to be one of the most annoying um, things that we had to deal with. And then if you kind of move into the context of what we're talking about today, we had our, our vulnerability scanning. Uh, it was very tactical, and I used I, – I, both organizations I work with, I ran vulnerability programs. And when I say program, I don't mean program in the sense of a large vulnerability management program. I mean literally just the program. That's all it was. Is I was running a scanner. Um, would discover the host, scan the host. I would create giant PDF files, email them to people. They would print them out. Uh, they would attempt to remediate, they were overwhelmed, and then we would rescan, and it was just a really hopeless life cycle that we went through. Um, definitely a big challenge for us. And then if you move forward, right, you send those reports, you're not, you know, the security guys oftentimes were not doing the remediation unless it's something that we control. Um, and so it's the operations groups that are doing that. We're sending these giant stacks of or virtual stacks in a PDF form of, of, of servers to patch and machines to fix and comp files to edit and so on and so forth. And it's really overwhelming. They're, little, they're, they're limited resources and doesn't garner the best relationship uh, between the security group and whoever the, that operations team is. You still see this today. Um, as we move on, let's come back to the future. Uh, Go back. There we go. So today, our jobs have uh, have definitely changed. It's it's not the consistent endpoints with, you know, homegrown applications or in-house applications. Now we have all of these apps. Now I don't know if you have ever read um, Andy Greenberg from Forbes. He writes a lot of good stuff on the security space. I recommend him. But this is one of my favorite titles he's ever written. How to quarantine Java like the disease it's become. We've got Java all over the place. We can't get rid of Java. People say get rid of Java. They don't even know the extent of Java being used in the environment. Java is so exploited, this is a big challenge for us. Um, and we have business needs that, that require Java to continue for quite some time. Um, then we have apps that are targeted like Acrobat Reader, uh, you know, malicious PDFs that are coming through. We've got Flash. We've got all these third-party applications. You know, we've done a relatively good job, um, or certainly a lot more operationally effective, to use WSUS to do patching of, of Windows uh, patches um, or SCCM for, for operating systems and things like that. But the third-party apps are a challenge for organizations. One of the things, and I don't know how it is in your, your, your companies, uh, 
how many people have their end users uh, have local admin rights on their machines? That's very, very much still pervasive with clients I talk to, and it's a big cultural change to take care of that. Um, and then if we add on bring your own computer, uh, which is emerging, right, how are we going to do a credentialed scan on someone's personal device? Um, and, and what are the implications of that? So it, the desktops, the endpoints aren't easier. Uh, then we have this being essentially the extended enterprise. This is the new office. Um, now, it varies from organization to organization. People like me, I'm always working remote. I'm working in coffee shops. I'm working at home. I only connect to an office once a month, usually. Um, for other users, you know, it would be transactional, perhaps a couple days a week. Um, they're, they're working in some type of remote scenario, but they're certainly beyond the perimeter. And when you look at the extended enterprise, the challenges that we have facing it, you know, the endpoints leave our control, so, so what good are our controls if the endpoints aren't within them? VPN, as I said, I, I VPN in once a month to do expense reports, and that's it. Uh, the consumerization with all the devices that now we can't touch or control. Um, the implications of virtualization um, on-prem and visibility into the virtual environments, um, and then extend that out with private cloud and public cloud type of arrangements. Um, we, we have a really difficult time understanding the risk that, that, that all of the, the benefits and challenges uh, that come with the extended enterprise. Um, in many ways, right, we're, we're surrounded, we're overwhelmed. You know, we, we need help. Um, I don't think you talk to anyone who feels like they've got a handle on either dealing with the threat landscape or just the operational realities of their job. Now, one of the things that, that we do at Forrester, right, we're a research company, so we have an annual survey. We just got our 2013 survey back uh, in July, and this is one of the data points that's in here. Um, the question that we asked, uh, let's see, what's our number here? Uh, just over 2,000 uh, respondents was, please rate the top IT security challenges in your firm. And the number one response from the uh, respondents was the changing or evolving nature of IT threats, internal and external. The threat landscape is a big challenge for companies. Um, it actually went down by two percentage points, which that's statistically within the margin of, of uh, you know, that they, they could be even depending on how the uh, uh, respondents responded to it. But I think the other thing to add on to that, too, is I look back, I didn't include the slide here. I think threats has been the number one concern um, for four years in a row now. So managing threats is definitely an issue for our, uh, for our clients. Um, as well as for you. Um, if we look back again today, right, operations still loves remediation. We're still having the same challenges uh, there. If you think about the third-party apps, right, how are you going to remediate third-party apps? You have to kludge together some kind of MSI update for a Windows executable to update it, um, deploy another system in addition to perhaps Microsoft that's going to handle the third-party patching. It definitely causes problems. Um, you know, our approach has, 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 in this space has been very tactical. Uh, a lot of, you know, the number one inquiry I actually get when people are asking about vulnerability management is how often should I scan X? Um, it seems like people really just want to, say, to know, okay, this is what Forrester says, or this is what NIST says, or this is what SAN says, how frequently I should scan my endpoints, my servers, et cetera. They're, they're very tactical. The perspective is very, very tactical, and that needs to change. The analogy that I like to bust out when it's football season, now I'm in Dallas. Um, I moved to Dallas in the 90s from Houston, so I was actually an Oilers fan. So when the Cowboys were winning, I could care less about the Cowboys. I was sad that there was no more Oilers. Uh, so I became a, a Cowboys fan uh, shortly after they stopped winning Super Bowls. And for 17 seasons now, or it's been 17 seasons since the Cowboys have won a Super Bowl, um, Jerry Jones has the same approach year after year after year, although the Cowboys did win yesterday. Don't get really excited about that. Um, you know, Jerry Jones is the one that when Jerry Jones, the owner, was asked by Bob Costas if he would fire Jerry Jones, the general manager, he said, I think so. Uh, um, nothing's going to change until Jerry Jones is, has passed on to the next plane, but of course he has so much money, uh, he'll, he'll live forever. So we, we don't want to have a Jerry Jones strategy. We need a new strategy. Um, so let's kind of talk about that. What we want to talk about is transitioning our program from this kind of tactical, uh, you know, very much scanner-oriented, um, you know, day-to-day -day activity to something more strategic. And so what, what I've designed here 
<clears throat> is I've got five steps that we can take. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. I apologize, I had to drink some water. Um, five steps that we can take to have a strategic uh, vulnerability management program. So the first piece, and Ed, Ed mentioned this when he was talking about <clears throat> some of the tripwire stuff at the top, is that we've got to change the focus from risk. We've got to switch from the scanner to actual risk. Now, for me, I am not a GRC analyst. We have colleagues that I work with that cover <clears throat> the GRC aspects. I personally have always found you know, risk to be, or the risk equation to be somewhat voodoo or tarot cards or fortune telling. It wasn't that uh, concrete for me. Um, but, you know, the high level, I guess to distill it down, that, that equation is risk is the probability that a threat will exploit a vulnerability and cause harm to an asset. And, and here, the things that we're talking about in this program are vulnerabilities, and we're talking about assets. Um, how many vulnerabilities are out there, and what is the risk to our organization um, based on the assets that are vulnerable? Um, we're overwhelmed with vulnerabilities. Take a, take a step back to Flash, Java, local admin rights, let users install all kinds of software on their machines. Um, one of the pieces um, that I also cover is, uh, is threat intelligence. And so threat intelligence kind of helps out with the likelihood component of this, I think. You know, what is the probability that a threat actor will ex attempt to exploit a vulnerability? If we can use some of intelligence capabilities, that kind of helps round out this equation a little bit for us. And because at the end of the day, I think that's what I, I want to do as a practitioner is kind of have a, a, a concrete feel for, you know, the risk to my organization um, versus uh, some metric that seems magical and not really sure what's happening in the background. That's, that's what we want our solutions to be able to help us do is to understand that. Give us the scope and breadth of what the challenges might be for us. And of course, you know, one of the, 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 the key pieces there <clears throat> is we need to triage. In, in much the same way the analogy you could use here from a vulnerability management program, it's almost like an untuned IDS alert. Uh, you think back to, a, we used to run Snort when I was in higher education, and we'd do a clean install of Snort, and the rules would just, would just overwhelm us. We had to go in and tweak it. Well, it's the same thing. We need to triage our IDS configuration. We need to triage our, our vulnerability management program. Uh, the key to do that is understanding your assets. Uh, there's a couple different types of assets uh, that we'll talk about as we go through this, but the number one most important thing to do is we have to understand our data and uh, what our most sensitive assets are. Now that can be, you know, physical assets associated with the program. That could be people. You know, it could be product manager who is running the IP uh, for whatever your widget is. Um, it's going to require uh, engagement with the business, and I think this is where uh, where we start to fall down in in this area. Companies are working so hard, so fast, limited resources both from an IT operations, security perspective, but also within the business unit themselves. And it, it requires collaboration to be able to understand, you know, the needs, desires, what's important to our business colleagues. Um, and so a lot of times we're working at the speed of business, which doesn't give us enough time to, to actually engage with the business. But we're going to have to do that. Um, the other piece that I think is really important here is understanding your assets. What's the top? You know, what's the max in your environment? You know, so often people say, well, I have an agent on all my devices uh, because they are reporting back. Well, what about the devices that you don't have an agent on, right? You have to have that upper bound uh, to be able to protect yourself. And, and we really need to group our assets together. And, and we don't recommend that you have a very complex uh, data classification program or anything like that. You know, identify what we would say the, the three, this is toxic data for us is the three P's in IP, right? So PCI data, PHI data, PII data, intellectual property equals toxic data. And that toxic data is what we need to understand. And understanding the toxic data is going to allow us to triage our vulnerability management program to make sure that we focus on the most important assets first. Now, I won't dig into this in detail, but I'll just kind of tease it out a little bit. So we have, uh, at Forrester, we have playbooks. Uh, so there's a particular security challenge or requirement that you need to do, and we have a playbook designed to help you with that. Um, one of our playbooks is on data privacy. In the data privacy playbook, we have a, a whole report series on our big data security and control framework. And this is basically helps people define, dissect, and defend their data. 
Um, and so basically we bubble down each one of these sections and have a whole report to help you with data discovery, to help you with data classification, to help you with analytics, so on and so forth. Um, so that's something that's out there. If you're interested in, in learning more about that, feel free to reach out to me. But basically we know that this is a challenge for organizations. We're trying to give you practical strategies to do this as well as push the vendor community to, to have more solutions available that enable it for us. So key is to absolutely understand your assets and help you triage what's going on in the environment. Um, the next piece is unified scanning. Now this is a little hard to see with the graphic uh, on the size that I put, but basically that's a database scanner, a web application scanner, and an infrastructure scanner. Um, in addition to running, uh, I guess it was Nessus, open source Nessus back in the day um, when I was running a program, but at different points in my career I also did application scanning. Now I am not a developer, I don't have a developer background, but I had a tool uh, 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 I forgot which tool it was, but one of the commercial web application scanners that I could probably use about 20% of. Um, I did not have the skill set to really understand how to maximize that tool. I couldn't speak developer to the developers to try to convince them of, uh, of, of vulnerabilities that existed in the environment. Um, this tool did not roll up into our, at that time, our uh, the other scanning platform that we had. We had disparate scanning solutions, and we actually had no scanning capability. We were doing no scanning at one, at one point in time on the databases at all. Uh, we need to have a unified vision. There may be multiple solutions, but somehow we have to unify and correlate what's going on. We need to be, and I'll beat this, I'll beat this line dead throughout the conversation today is, you know, if you have a, and I'll use a PCI as an example, because it kind of makes sense, right? You have your PCI program. You know what assets are in scope for PCI. Hopefully it's segmented out so you minimize what your, uh, the scope of a, an assessment is, but you could substitute PCI for, uh, this is this program that's associated with this new drug that we're developing. You know, all the assets that are lined up there, you're going to have databases. Uh, you're potentially going to have web applications, either internal or external applications. You're going to have all the infrastructure. You need to be able to have a view of that program, and that's why unified scanning is so important. Um, otherwise, you, you're not getting the full picture of what's going on, and you really don't understand what the risk to that particular platform is. Um, I still, now for me, this was many years ago when we struggled here, um, one of the things that I do as a forester analyst is I do a lot of consulting with enterprises. So we go in and do strategic consulting. Um, we do uh, maturity assessments, things of that nature. And for most companies uh, that I work with, they don't have unified program here. They have maybe two of the three products that are out there. And maybe you don't need, from a resource perspective, a full-blown web application scanner. And perhaps you can leverage the web application scanning capability of the existing scanner you have, and that's certainly a good place to start out. Um, but we have to pull this together. I, I see it as a big deficiency when I work with customers. Um, one of the things that I talk about, I have economies of scale from using the same solution. I have reducing operational friction. Friction is something that's kind of a little buzzwordish for us, right? We talk about creating friction for the attackers to slow them down so that we're able to detect them easier. Um, well, what about all the friction we impose on ourselves because we have too many solutions, we have not enough staff, we have poor processes, poor oversight, right? We need to look for, in any solution you're buying, no matter if it's a VM solution or new firewall, whatever, we need to look for opportunities to reduce friction and make our jobs easier so that we can actually be responsive to the threats that are out there. So I think that's a key component is actually looking at the operational effort required to run solutions. All right, so step four, effective triage. Um, here, the, the main thing, and I've said triage several times, here I actually have a, a triage sheet. I was actually just watching, let's see, what was that, last week on a plane, um, White House Down, I think it was, not the one with uh, with uh, Chatham Tanning or whatever that guy's name is, but the one with the guy from 300 uh, with the Spartans where the White House gets taken out. And he's calling his wife up, and she's in the hospital, and she's a nurse, and she's talking to a doctor saying, okay, how do we want to mark these patients? How do we want to triage them with numbers or colors? You know, when you're having an incident, that's not the time to figure out your triage process. So this kind of extends to the incident response piece. But as I've said several times uh, this morning so far is that, you know, we need to triage our vulnerability management program to make it more effective. Um, 
And, and one of the key components is, and you still, I, I think this is resonating more, but you have to understand we're not going to be able to defend everything. Um, you're, you're not defending everything anyway, right? Um, we're, we're having a hard time scanning across our organization, patching across our organization visibility. Uh, so you have to realize that there are certain assets they're going to have to be sacrificed for the greater good. Now, I have had some interesting conversations with some some guys that run, you know, pen testing companies and things like that. And, you know, they say, well, if all you do is focus on your high-value targets, then I am just going to go to Rick Holland's machine that I know he's still running, you know, an unpatched version of whatever is on there. I'm going to exploit it, and that's how I'm going to pivot into the environment. And And I think that's true, but... Pragmatically, if, if you're not if your job is not doing pen testing all day long, um, not to minimize that that discipline at all, but from a pragmatic operational perspective, you don't have enough resources to patch everything. Um, and then on top of that, the diminishing returns that you get from trying to do the entire environment, uh, you realize them very very quickly. And then it only takes one zero day attack for all of your effort to go away. So I really think we need to change our mindset to, to understand that we're not going to be able to protect everything. Um, in the Verizon data breach report, um, speaking of zero days, uh, one of the comments that I liked the best um, in that report is, you know, why, I can't remember the exact words on it, but, you know, why use a cruise missile when the screen door is wide open? Um, most of the time, we, we don't have to use a zero day for organizations. We can hit the low-hanging fruit. So how do I respond or what would my, my guidance be on that? is you have to protect the most important stuff, right, the toxic data. We have to have the visibility into that. That's when we're going to make sure that we have the fastest return SLAs for uh, getting patches down um, to doing periodic scanning. Um, that type of stuff will help you triage that. Um, but I think this is where other controls come into play. Since you can't patch, you can't remediate everything that you find in a VAM program, you're going to have to have some other visibility. So maybe the generic laptop user um, uh, maybe they, they get higher priority because they have a laptop that's going in and out of the environment versus the desktops on the inside of the environment. Maybe they get a lower priority um, for patching, given that laptops are in the environment for very long. Um, but, you know, you start with the toxic data, how you're able to pivot to those. Um, one of the things I like is do you know if you're looking at the database servers that host whatever that crown jewel is, who can talk to that database server? This is where where knowing the most important data, understanding those relationships with the business help you understand, you know, what the threats are that are out there, how they're using the systems. It takes time to understand how all this works. I realize there's no easy button for it. Um, but knowing what, what assets can talk to the critical assets and providing a higher level of protection there. And then also complementing it with visibility, internal IDSs, um, solutions that give you uh, network visibility from a, a forensics perspective, you're going to have to complement this as well. Um, of course, high-value targets come into play, which which would include the individuals as well, C-suite, things like that. Um, there was a talk, I don't know if anyone out there saw this or not, but at Black Hat, I think they were Italian, I, I don't remember, they, they, did a, uh, they did a talk on, on uh, CVSS scoring as a priority, um, and they found that if you were trying to patch all mediums and highs, um, that the attacks going after those were, were not that great and you would be wasting a lot of your efforts. I'd recommend Google it and you can get some details on it, um, but it really in illustrates the diminishing returns. The one thing that's really key is things that are being actively exploited. You know, if something's loaded up into Metasploit, if something's loaded up into one of the crimeware packs, those are the, the solutions or those are the, you know, when you know that that pack is exploiting X vulnerability, that's when we need to start uh, start start patching. Now, in a perfect world, on your high-value assets, we're going to be patching anyway, but for a broader sense of patching or remediation, whatever that remediation might be, is we need to make that move. So I think it's really important when you're looking at solutions to make sure that they have the ability to track what's happening out in the wild and, and, and bump that priority up for yourself to help you with that triage. Okay, so metrics, everyone's least favorite uh, topic. Um, metrics aren't easy, but let's kind of separate this into two different levels, and we'll start with the operational, and then we'll move to the strategic slash management type of stuff. Um, you can't manage what you don't measure. You've heard this statement before. It's no surprise. Um, one of the things that I think we need to be tracking, and this is 
strategic measurement of an operational um, activity is tracking the amount of effort that's required to operate the solution um, as well as remediation. How much effort is required for the operations group to go and do this for a priority one um, remediation need um, and, and keep track of that over time so you understand the amount of effort that's going into your organization. Um, this could help you understand perhaps uh, if you need to make a move to a managed service provider or you need to make a move to a SaaS model. You'll have some data here that helps. I think that's important. I don't think people in general, no matter what the security technology, do a good job of tracking both the efficacy of the solution and the operational efficiency of the solution and we need to be doing that. Um, I also think when you're doing an after-action review, after you've had an incident, go back and see how the devices that were compromised in this incident are were lined up with your vulnerability management program. Um, were they low-hanging fruit? Did you miss something? Well, there's some type of attack vector or path that you, you did not see. And, you know, those are kind of higher-level operational things that I think you need to think about. Um, when you when you start digging into metrics uh, from an operations perspective to track, um, I think most solutions do a pretty good job um, with this. Key things that I like to think about is tracking by division, business unit, um, the program itself, like the PCI program or the Widget X program, tracking the, uh, the operating systems, tracking the applications. What's our, you know, is Java our most exploited application out there? Okay, we've now ratcheted up our We've pulled Java off of the machines that the users don't need it. The users that do need Java, we put some compensating controls on. And over time, how has this trended? Um, number of machines that we have total within the environment. Um, this is where I think the discovery piece is, is pretty important here is to try to discover new assets. But I laugh when I, when I wrote this down in my talking notes. You know, reconcile that with your CMDB. And if, if your organization is like any organization I've ever been, our CMDB is, you know, it's really difficult to have a good authentic, authentic, uh, authentic source of record um, that's accurate for the number of machines that we have in the environment. And perhaps we, we work with procurement on that as well. But in, in the companies I've worked for, this is always a challenge, uh, particularly as you move into the BYOD scenario or bring your own computer. Um, as you transition, this is one thing that I think is an important thing to know. Once again, this is from our Foresight Security Survey. Um, question here, um, and it actually goes on to have some more information, but I'll tell you what that is, is what impact, if any, have, ha have high-profile cyber attacks had on security? And then we reference things like um, the Sony PlayStation breach, Stuxnet, things of that nature, you know, the, the front page um, types of attacks. And the number one, and this has been the case for two years in a row now at least, is that it's raised awareness for executives. Actually, scratch that. Since the year that Sony happened, this has been one of the top, if not the top, um, uh, impact uh, from the threat landscape, is that executives are more aware now. So I think that's a good thing. Now, what I do say is that executive awareness is not a security control, but it's something that we need to take advantage of. Um, and it continues, right? I mentioned Sony and Stuxnet, but throw APT1 report in. Um, most recently throw in the, the Syrian Electronic Army with the New York Times. Um, these, this awareness is staying there. So I think it's an opportunity to capture that awareness to help drive some of our security goals. Um, so as we kind of dig into the next slide, you know, as I said, take advantage of ne executive awareness. But, you know, saying things like we were able to effectively remediate 85 percent of CVSS category highs is going to, you know, put people to sleep. They're not going to care about it. That's not the kind of metrics that management is concerned about. There's definitely value in, in you, you tracking from an operational tactical perspective metrics at that level, but certainly not reporting up the chain of command. Are they that interested? You know, they are interested in more along with things like this. It's tying it back to business initiatives um, and, and how you're protecting the uh, assets that are part of whatever that business initiative is. And this is actually a cut from a report a colleague of mine, Ed Ferrara, did um, which is, I, mean, I think it was titled something along, you know, don't bore your executives, speak to them in a language they understand. Um, and he's got a number of suggestions on how to actually, and this is broader than just vulnerability management, um, uh, how to actually engage with them. I think things that are important to understand is that metrics evolve, especially the high-level metrics, right? It's not a one-and-done scenario, so you're going to seek feedback on those particular metrics. Make sure that they're valuable for, for them. Um, it's a cultural shift. If a company is not used, if you've never reported up the chain of command before, if you don't, if the security leadership doesn't have a quarterly or annual meeting with the board, 
you know, it's going to take time for them to understand this stuff. They'll have to get used to it, have to understand the value of it. Um, something else is we do a pretty good job of technology metrics measuring, you know, this is the number of, back to that example of, you know, the number of CVS, S, X, whatever that might be, a good job there. We don't do as good a job of managing processes, which is why I was saying measuring the process of vulnerability management say that again, measuring the process of vulnerability management, but the operational effectiveness of your program, does it make more sense to go to SAS, things like that. We need to focus on process measurement as well and how successful that is. You know, um, leadership wants to know if the investment they've made in a program and staff and people um, is, 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 is good for them. We're going to dig a little bit m more into metrics here as well. Um, I think the and I mentioned this before, I've asked probably the fourth or fifth time I mentioned on the call, is tying back into What's most important to the organization? How do you make money? Um, if you're not a you know private industry where you're trying to make money, how do you do X? If you're an agency, you know how are you trying to accomplish whatever your mission is? Understanding that stuff. This goes back to the assets component of knowing your data to help you with triage. That will help you know what's most important, and then you build metrics around that. Um, you know both the vulnerabilities and remediation. Remediation is something that you know we had a problem, and this is how long it took to fix. Um, are we improving? Are we doing better? Management wants to know the overall high-level trends. You know, we've, we've had some risk here. We've identified it. we tweaked our program, and, and we've moved forward. Um, once again, how much effort, man hours, is going into this program, particularly on the remediation side? Um, and then I think something that's a big opportunity in general is, is, is showing our value, right? Whenever the security team comes and knocks on a door, uh, people are like, great, what just happened? You know, what material weakness am I about to hear about? We just get breached. Are we going to be on CNN? Um, so on and so forth. But I really think that capturing executive awareness, you know, working with your management uh, to, to present to them and show them the wins that you had. Say, look, we, our program, PCI program, whatever it is, you know, was vulnerable. We were able to patch it. And when this big whatever the next big is that makes the front page news, say, look, we were proactively protected from that. And start showing how you're, you're giving value to the company and helping out, I think is really important. And then to wrap up, if, if and, and, and as a teaser, you know, the next time, and which will probably be in, in, in 2014, when I do a wave on the vulnerability management space, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change from, uh, in the past, you, you were doing a, a, an evaluation of a scanner, right? When we do our next evaluations, they're going to be much broader than a scanner. A scanner is very strategic. It's an important component of an overall program, um, but we're talking a lot more. And so what I put here is these are kind of a teasers on the types of criteria that I would use to evaluate vendors um, the next time that we, we do a wave in the space. And I think one of the first pieces and on the scanner side um, is asset discovery. We've got to have good capabilities about we want to know what the max is in our organization, so we need to know that. Um, we need a solution that breaks down silos and shares information. I did a blog about three weeks ago uh, called something along the lines of point solutions must die. Um, we need integrated solutions out there. We need to make, we need to reduce that operational friction that we're encountering. So when you're looking at, an uh, looking at a solution, uh, what other capabilities do they have that you can kind of add together? You know, is it a scanning solution? Does it have configuration management? Is there SIM tie-ins? You know, what can we add together to give us more information, to give us more context, to help us understand the risk to our environments? Um, and, and, and outside of the, the, the vulnerability management space as well, do we, as I mentioned, SIM, NAV is a Forrester category that we have for network analysis and, and visibility. So some of that packet capture, forensics, meta packet capture type solutions, you know, look for solutions that are going to do more. In, in fact, for every solution that you buy, should be looking at what kind of integrations they have. Um, as I said, right, unified infrastructure, uh, unified meaning infrastructure scanning, our traditional scanning, our web app scanning, and our database scanning. Make sure that if you don't have all three of those components in your environment that, that you move that way. Um, something else, and you may not want to move to a SaaS model, um, but consider uh, a vendor that has a SaaS capability. Um, Typically, people will start off with their PCI scanning for ASV requirement um, in this space and then perhaps grow. But because of some of the operational challenges, um, friction that's, that comes with a, a vulnerability management program, if a company doesn't have the resources or decide they want to redeploy those resources for another purpose, um, the SAS option is something nice to fall back on. And then 
course, I've said this several times before, and I don't think I can say it enough, is, you know, operational effectiveness is, is key. You know, what good is it um, if you have a Porsche sitting in your garage that you don't know how to drive, um, that has no gasoline in it, but it looks great in your garage, right? You want to be able to bring in solutions. You're going to spend six figures, seven figures, whatever the case may be on a technology into your environment. You want to make sure you can take advantage of it. So um, if it's not going to be effective for you, then I don't think it should be on your short list. And with that, that's my final slide. So let me turn it back over to Ed. And thank you for uh, for joining. Thanks, Rick. Uh, lots of great info in there. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. And um, just a reminder to all the attendees, um, we will be dis we'll be sending out a link to a recording of this presentation. So if you, uh, you know, I'm, I know there's a lot of good info in that presentation. If you wanted to share any of that with your colleagues, um, we'll have a link for you to, to hand that out. Uh, so thanks again, Rick. And uh, before we move into our Q&A session, I just wanted to take uh, a few minutes to talk about Tripwire's vulnerability management solution, IP360. So with IP360, um, the, the product provides actionable vulnerability intelligence that's intended to help you efficiently and effectively manage the constant change of security risk that, that happens in uh, our complex computing environments. So how do we do that? Well, we do that by, by helping you prioritize or you know, triage your work and discover things on your network that you don't know about, and also measure how effectively uh, you are reducing risk in your environment. So taking kind of a, a deeper look um, when I talk about prioritization, um, you know, no giant PDFs here. <laughs> So when we do reporting or information for uh, remediation, we use the Tripwire uh, vulnerability risk scoring, which calculates the severity of a vulnerability based on how easy it is to exploit and then the level of access an attacker could gain, could gain um, using that exploit, uh, along with the asset and network values that add that business context. So, you know, it's written. Uh, Rick mentioned earlier if there's, you know, if you're se separating things out by a compliance initiative or, you know, Project X, um, you can assign asset values and, and network values um, so that you're providing that business context that's going to help you focus on remediating the vulnerabilities that, that really matter, that, you know, the most bang for your buck in this case. And then to also deal with the changing and, and evolving nature of, of IT threats, um, both internal and external to your environment, um, we have a research team here at Tripwire, the Vulnerabilities and Exposure Research Team, or also known as VERT, and their job is providing ongoing and up-to-date coverage of vulnerability checks. And we even do this, uh, we offer a 24-hour SLA on Microsoft advisories. So every month, you know, Tripwire is there with you on, you know, Patch Tuesday, working late, so that you can catch those uh, most recent um, vulnerabilities as, as, they, as they come out. So, you know, hardworking team of research engineers that um, are always working to provide that up-to-date coverage. And when you're doing your scanning in your environment, um, you know, we, we can do this continuously. So once the scan finishes, we can start up another one. We can uh, do periodic, scheduled, and uh, on-demand scanning and so that you're getting the right coverage uh, that uh, is appropriate for your environment. And then if we talk about, um, so actually going back to the SANS coverage I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about the uh, NCIRCLE acquisition, I mentioned, um, you know, the critical contr uh, controls, you know, one through four, you know, if we look at number one and two, Right there, inventory of authorized and unauthorized devices and applications. So we can help you with that as well by taking an inventory of your network. So not only are you finding, you know, vulnerabilities, but also potentially devices and software and really kind of other liabilities that you don't even know about. And we hear from customers all the time, you know, telling us that they're surprised about what they found on their network. So, you know, we've had customers that said, well, I, I knew I was running Solaris, but I didn't know that we were running nine different versions of it. And then there's also, um, 
when, when you look at, and you think about web applications, so as far as web applications that may have vulnerabilities, uh, you know, you might be running some obscure web application written by a small mom and pop shop or an in-house, you know, custom app that somebody on uh, within your organization has developed. Th those aren't going to be, you know, necessarily on a, on a security research team's radar. So how are you going to find out what vulnerabilities exist in those apps? And what we can do with IP360, our vulnerability management product, um, is dis discover those web applications. Um, so we can do things like check for cross-site scripting, SQL injections, and other implementation flaws. And um, you know, if, if you're familiar with the OWASP top 10, we provide coverage in each area of the top 10. And What's really great about this, you know, when we talk about integrating these solutions for more of the st strategic approach to vulnerability management, these scans are taking place, um, or the results of these scans are there alongside your vulnerability management information. So you get really a comprehensive risk uh, view of risk across your, your organization. And also, when we talk about finding these things, you know, finding these vulnerabilities, discovering what devices and, and software you have on your network. We're not just talking about the internal network, but also the, the perimeter of your network, or even remote offices, partner offices, or, you know, let's say you've just gone, under, uh, gone through a, a merger or acquisition, and you need to do due diligence on those external networks. Um, that can be kind of difficult, you know, with limited resources to go out and set up, a, you know, a vulnerability scan or the infrastructure to do that. And so what we offer with IP360 is a SaaS option called PureCloud. And PureCloud allows that vulnerability scanning or even um, PCI DSS scanning via the cloud. So you just basically fire up a web browser, start scanning, no software or hardware to install. And um, I, I think we probably have a couple of uh, attendees on the, on the line today that are tripwire log center users and you know there's something really great we've just recently announced we're you know only a couple of months away from the the um, acquisition of NCircle and we've already announced our first integration which is between IP360 and our Tripwire log center and this is a really um, great way of kind of leveraging both sources of information, so we're not, you know, siloing that data, we're really kind of combining it to get that additional intelligence, you know, integrating vulnerability management and log management systems um, for intelligent correlation and faster breach detection, um, and we're really excited about that, you know, of course we have a lot of uh, other grid things in the, in the works there, um, but, you know, really the key here is, you know, the integration, it's not just a silo, you know, vulnerability assessment solution, it's, you know, kind of integrating and bringing together these controls to really good, get good information and, and good actionable intelligence. And then, of course, you know, as we, as we just uh, discussed uh, during the presentation, you know, how, how do we measure what, um, you know, how effective we're, we're, we are with our vulnerability management program and then how do we, you know, communicate that information because it's, you know, it's not just about counting vulnerabilities, it's about measuring risk. And IP360 helps organizations measure and analyze and communicate proactively and effectively with key stakeholders. Um, you know, like Rick mentioned, uh, you know, execs <laughs> probably don't care so much about CVSS scores. They want to know, you know, are things getting better or are things getting worse? And IP360 helps you do this with a library of report templates. And again, you know, incorporating that business context, such as asset and network values, so that you can prove that you're driving vulnerability risk in the right direction. And it's not just for executives either. The, the reporting in IP360 includes something for every, everyone. You know, if you're working with auditors, um, of course, you know, work with the security team, and then also, you know, those IT operations teams um, so that they, uh, you know, don't hate remediation uh, <laughs> too much, you know, make it a little bit easier on them. And with that, um, we can go ahead and open it up to our Q&A section. And um, just also wanted to mention that if, if you did want to learn more about IP360, um, go ahead and head over to uh, tripwire.com and um, check out the pages on our vulnerability management solution. 
So we'll go ahead and open up the Q&A session. So if you haven't already, uh, please enter your questions into the uh, question screen on your, on your uh, web browser. All right, so we've got a question uh, coming in. I've heard Forrester talk about zero trust. How does this apply to vulnerability management? So I think okay. this would be a question um, for Rick. Yeah, I'll take this one. Um, so a quick high level on zero trust. Zero trust is something uh, my colleague John Kindervog, uh, uh developed and marketed probably about three years ago, and it's basically assuming all packets are, are bad. There's no trust but verify. That That's an, a, a dead adage. It needs to be zero trust. Um, and visibility into the network and visibility in general is one of the key components. There's a lot more to this, but what will be specific here from a VM program is the visibility component. The VM program is going to give us visibility into the risk into our environment um, so that we know what's going on. I, I do think an interesting tie on here is uh, zero trust is very network centric. Um, the nice point about having a solution that would have an agent on it that's running um, when you're outside of the perimeter, when you're the, in the extended enterprise. But for our purposes, your trust is all about visibility on the endpoint when it's in the environment or even when the endpoint when it's outside of the environment so that we know what's going on with it. And I think that's probably the best way it ties in. Once again, we have five or six pieces of research on zero trust. So if, if you're interested to learn more, hit me on uh, Twitter and, and we can have a follow-up conversation. Great. Thanks, Rick. And uh, keep, keep the questions coming. So you should have a, a questions option on your screen. Go ahead and type in any questions that you have. All right, and uh, another question, uh, how can I protect my Windows endpoints when they are beyond the perimeter, concerned about waterhole types of attacks? So that's, that's actually a good segue from my previous one. Um, once again, right, when we're in the extended enterprise and we're leaving our environment, you know, how do we protect them? So I, I think two ways, one is obviously having something on them when they're outside to, to help give us some protection there. But I think er, earlier in the conversation I mentioned uh, laptops and that perhaps a laptop should have a higher risk profile than a, a, a non, uh, non-laptop something that's never going to leave the environment. So adding a higher level of rigor from a vulnerability management program to the mobile devices, which sure, maybe they come into the environment once a week or very infrequently, or it could be every day, but when they do, um, that they're going to get a higher level of scanning, more frequent scanning, um, maybe more credential scans than others, um, understanding what's on them when they come in the environment, new apps that have been installed, whatever, you know, what's the threat, what's the vulnerability uh, footprint on these devices and trying to minimize that when it comes in. So um, I definitely think we have to have, we have to be concerned about those waterhole attacks. Um, but in general, we've got to be concerned about anything when people are beyond the perimeter of our traditional security controls and having as much visibility onto those assets when they do come in um, and, and making sure that we have the appropriate controls on those devices is, is what we need to do. Great. Thank you. All right, so we um, just have a, a couple more minutes left. Uh, anyone else have any questions they uh, would like to ask? Feel free to type those into the, the questions box. Um, and while we're waiting for uh, some more questions to come in, I just wanted to uh, invite everyone um, to our next webcast. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about Tripwire's vulnerability scoring and really what are uh, the ingredients to our secret sauce, are for our vulnerability scores. I'd like to invite you to join the Tripwire VERT team, our research team, for our next webcast where Lamar Bailey, the director of the VERT team, is going to um, provide you with a better understanding of our vulnerability score and why it's so granular. And the difference between our score and other scores like uh, CVSS. And then, you know, today when we talked about business context, um, Lamar is going to get into you know, what that means for measuring vulnerability risk, how it helps us become more efficient um, when we're managing that risk. So uh, one last call here. Any other questions for our attendees on the line? All right. Well, I think we're, we're good here. So thanks uh, for joining us today. And uh, thanks again to Rick Holland from Forrester. Uh, for joining us and sharing his his thoughts on strategic VM, and of course, thanks for everyone 
for attending. Um, we hope that you found the presentation informative and interesting. And uh, please remember to rate and comment this webcast in the rating section. And as I mentioned earlier, be on the lookout for an email from me with the link to the on-demand version recording of this webcast so that you can uh, forward this on to anyone who wasn't able to make it. All right. Thanks, everyone, and have a great week.